Okay. Well, let me thank um, all the parents for being here, and especially the young people. Uh, this is the <clears throat> ninth year that we've done the uh, State of the Union essay contest. This year we had close to 600 kids in Vermont in 50 schools who participated. And the young people that you are looking at are the top 20 winners. So congratulations to these young people. Uh, three of the top 20 are not going to be here today. Um, I especially, uh, after spending time in Washington, enjoy this event very, very much. <laughs> I think you will probably end up agreeing with me that there's a lot more wisdom uh, from our young people in the state uh, here uh, than we often see in the nation's capital. Um, the purpose of, of the essay contest is to get the kids thinking about uh, what is going on in our country, why it's going on, and, and where they would like it to go. Essentially, if they were president of the United States, uh, what kind of State of the Union speech they would give, what would be the themes, what would be the most important issues uh, that uh, they believe the country should address. And I got to tell you, having read all of the essays, you would be, you would be, and you will be impressed uh, by these young people. So what we're going to do is uh, we're going to go around the table and we'll have the young people talk a little bit uh, about uh, what they wrote and why they wrote it. And guys, there's nothing to be nervous about. And I will be a pest and maybe ask you a few questions as you go along. And then we'll open it up for discussion. You guys can comment on each other's work. Uh, but anyhow, congratulations to you all. You did a great job. So uh, we're going to start off uh, with uh, uh, Friedos, Friedos Mohammed uh, from uh, Essex High School. Um, Friedos, what did you write about and why? Um, okay, so I wrote about Islamophobia uh, facing the U.S. and I wrote about it because I wanted to make it personal to me and as you can see I'm a Muslim so I wanted to shed light on a problem that faces a lot of Muslims around the globe but not a lot of people know about. Good, thank you very much. Uh, Joseph, um, what did you write about? Yeah, so I wrote about um, the barriers that uh, middle class and working Americans face um, from voting and on election day. And I wrote about it because if you know the opinions and beliefs of middle class Americans aren't safeguarded and reflected in voting, um, then politicians will continue to reflect the opinions of the elite. Okay. Um, Megan Benway is with uh, Mrs. Sisquoi Valley Union. She's the one we're waiting on. Okay. Uh, Thomas Buckley with Col <coughs> Colchester. Yeah. Um, so I talked about uh, how the system that we use to elect our representatives is fundamentally flawed. The plurality system, like the plurality voting system that we use um, is ineffective and leads to um, the same two parties with the same uh, sort of uh, voter frustration without any kind of, um, without allowing for people to vote for third parties if they want to without uh, destroying their uh, without wasting their vote. And what's your remedy? Uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> so um, I, I think uh, ranked choice voting, which they use in Maine, or have started to use in Maine, is effective to an extent, at least with dealing with the spoiler effect, which is the problem of uh, people being unable to vote third party without losing their, um, without losing their ability to uh, without uh, voting for the, without voting accidentally for the party that they like the least. And that took place in Maine and they elected a congressman on that basis. Okay, uh, Brendan Byrne? Uh, I talked and Brendan's at Essex High School as well. Yep. Um, I talked about climate change and how I feel like that's one of the biggest problems our world and our country is facing right now, because uh, it's gonna affect everybody on the planet. Um, I think the best way to go after it and resolve it is a kind of effort nationally led by the government uh, similar to the New, New Deal with FDR and um, just the collective action. 
And I wrote my essay before I realized that the Green New Deal was actually a thing. <laughs> yeah. so you're taking credit for that, right? <laughs> we'll see. Yeah. It's a good politician, right? <laughs> okay, thanks, Brandon. Uh, Caroline Castle is at Hartford yes. High School. Um, I wrote about xenophobia and how much of a major problem it is to our world today. Uh, because after living overseas for six years, I began to realize that people were, were treating me differently and treating other people in my school differently based upon our experiences overseas. And they had all these misconce misconceptions about who I was and who um, other people were based on stereotypes that they had learned about. Priodos, do you want to comment on that? Do you agree? <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I mean, um, after the 9-11 attacks, I mean, I wasn't born yet, obviously, but wearing the hijab, you kind of represent your whole religion in a way, and I feel like that's a stereotype we need to break. Good. Uh, Colin Chodak Cressy is at Burlington High School. Um, I, too, wrote about climate change, and as a young person, what the younger generation can hopefully do, and I wrote about global solutions that are necessary to fight climate change. Colin, what is the major obstacle to moving forward on uh, dealing with climate change? Um, uh, American spirit, I would guess, people that are just not motivated to fight climate change, even though it is an increasingly important challenge. Other thoughts on climate change? What is the major obstacle? Is there anybody who is interested in protecting their interests through fossil fuels? Yeah. Who has a thought on that? Anybody? Yeah. Andy? Yeah, they're, they're through tax carbon, like car, taxing carbon is very important. So they, the wealthy people they get affected. And also, I, I talked about I talk about starting small in our communities, and that would lead to the bigger goals on climate change. Like starting okay. Yeah. All right, but let me pick up. Is there anybody who thinks fossil fuels are just great? And do they have any influence over what goes on? Well, it's, I know I'm, I'm raising that because I, a number of you have written about environmental issues and climate change. I want you to think about this for a second. Things they happen for a reason, yes. They have a lot of input with their donations and who is who is they? Uh, just lobbyist groups such as representing who? Uh, the energy companies like Exxon Mobil and those sorts of things. Okay. Do you sometimes see ads on television about coming from Exxon Mobil and other companies about all the great work they're doing? Yeah. A lot of a misinformation campaign. There's Good. also the idea that if we try to attack climate change, it'll hinder the American economy. Good. Okay. I want to keep moving, and we're going to get back to uh, that issue. Um, Paige Dean is at South Burlington High School, Paige. I also wrote about climate change. Uh, as many others have said, I think it's the greatest issue facing the world, and especially our generation. And um, I also wrote about some of the possible solutions um, to mitigating climate change, such as um, uh, the economy, moving forward with legislation, and building partnerships with businesses, and uh, also our allies worldwide. Good. The last point that you make is an important one. And by the way, guys, these microphones are there for a reason. <laughs> I think we don't have enough of them. Maybe we'll push this one down. Let me get this one. Yes, we are, I think, recording this, right? All right, so we can't record it well if you're not speaking into the mic. So why don't we push this one down a little bit? And uh, I think we have more on this side. Okay. Um, you raised, um, Paige, you raised the simple reality that climate change is an international issue. The United States could do all the right things, and it wouldn't matter much if China and India and Russia and other major countries uh, did not also go forward. Who wants to pick up on that one? How do you deal internationally with this issue? Thoughts? Uh, I think it's through the UN, right? Good. That's why we made the UN, so that countries can communicate with each other about global issues, and global climate change is a global issue. All right, is uh, somebody raised the issue about, um, you know, if you uh, transform the energy system and it will have a negative impact on, on workers who work in oil and coal and gas, 
Uh, is there another side of that, which is true, is there another side of that story as well? Can you create jobs by moving toward a green type economy? Henry, do you think so? Yeah. Grab that mic there if you could, please. Yeah, I definitely agree that um, although there's, um, we're negatively impacting um, workers in fossil fuel industries, um, we need to recognize that, but we also um, be, need to avoid catastrophes greater than the temporary economic loss that will occur, and we can help those people um, by implementing renewable energy and maybe helping them transfer, like work in the renewable energy field. Good. Okay. I'm probably going to mispronounce the next name here. It's it's Anissa. Is that Denby? Yeah. Am I close? <laughs> okay, grab the mic there, Nisa. Uh, Nisa's at St. Johnsbury Economy. Um, I wrote about women's reproductive rights in America and continuing support and uh, funding for Planned Parenthood in America. Okay, and what's happening on that issue in this country today? Well, a lot of representatives in different states are trying to defund Planned Parenthood, and um, I feel like that's going to affect millions of women in America because they don't just do abortion. Uh, Isabel de Roche, do I have that right, Isabel? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, Isabel is at Burn Burton Academy. Yeah. Um, so I wrote my essay about um, civility and political polarization in um, both the local and national stage, which was originally inspired by, um, in my area, there was a situation with a very rude uh, lawn sign during our uh, local elections and you know, some situations that could have been handled better. Initially started out as something for the local newspaper, but I thought that it was perfect for State of the Union materials. It is. Who wants to pick up on that? Is, is I think we sometimes say in Washington, uh, you can disagree with somebody without being disagreeable. Is that kind of what you're talking about, Isabel? Well? Yeah. What about that? Have we reached a stage where disagreement results in all kinds of enmity and hatred and all that stuff? How do we deal with that? That's an important issue. Um, yep. I think my, my essay was kind of talking about polarization as well because I think what's important is uh, something like ranked choice voting means that if you're competing for second choice votes, you're not going to spend your time demonizing your opposition because if you have to demonize because that's going to mean that people aren't going to put you down as your second choice candidate in the likelihood. So you need to put, I think, real uh, incentives in place to uh, change political discourse for the better. Um, do you guys have friends who hold different political views than you do? Yeah. yeah. Are you able to speak with them in a civil manner and learn from each other? Who wants to talk about that? Talk yeah. about it. Yeah, I think that the issue right now with politics is that there's so much ego in politics where it's become less about doing what's right for the country, but more about what's doing doing what makes you look best as a politician. And I think, you know, politicians need to try to separate themselves from their egos, from making themselves look better. And, you know, as citizens, you know, looking past, you know, just, you know, the maybe statistics of a candidate and really looking into what they, um, what they actually do. Well, you're touching on a, a very good issue, I think. Um, and that is, if you think about, when you turn on the TV and you hear about politics, a lot of it has to do with the politician himself or herself, right? right rather than the issues impacting the American people. And I think that is a very, very, very serious issue. Um, because what politics should be about is what are the issues impacting all of us and how do you best address it, whose ideas are best, who do you agree with? But too often they really focus on the, uh, the fact that politicians uh, have uh, problems or deficiencies, they're not perfect human beings, and we talk about that all of the time. I'm sensitive about that issue, as you can see. My <laughs> yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, I just, I just like to talk about how, like, we do live in Vermont, and I live in Burlington, and it's in my school. All my friends, my like, the group that I hang out with is like mostly uh, left leaning, and and when we, and we're growing up in a time where a lot of we, we, we disagree with, with our current president a lot, and, and, and he's kind of representing the Republican Party in a way. And so when, when we think Republican, uh, my school, like most of my friends just think back. And, 
and it's not necessarily. And so good. And uh, that's a good point. Uh, and we should know, being in the State House right now, that uh, there have been Republican leaders, people like Senator Aiken and Senator Strafford and uh, Jim Jeffords um, and, and others, uh, Dick Snelling, uh, whose views as Republicans are very, very different, or very, very different than uh, Donald Trump's, for example. And it's important to understand that history. Okay, let's go to, um, am I pronouncing this right, uh, Livia, or is it Livia? Livia Greenberg at the Stratton Mountain School. Thanks. I talked about the cost of health care, specifically how medical monopolies were able to control prices to the point that it made most medical necessities unavailable to the majority of American people. Good. Who wants to pick up on <laughs> Livia's point on health care? Which polling shows is, is way up there as one of the most important issues that the American people care about. What about health care? What's the key? Let me get to some. Some of you haven't been talking too much. Going to get to you guys. <laughs> All right, Fiona. What about healthcare? Here, grab that mic there. Good. All right. When uh, Fiona says. It, 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 what do you say? It, it's so necessary. Okay, everybody, almost everybody, in one cause or another, one moment or another in their lives, is going to require health care. So, what is the fundamental issue? For me, no, no. What is when we think about health care? <laughs> when we think about health care, what is the defining issue? And Fiona kind of touched on it. One. One. No. One of the fundamental human rights All right. is oh. having good health Okay, that's health. the issue. So the issue is, and there are people who disagree on this, and we can go into it, but the fundamental issue is, is health care a human right or is it not? All right, give me the two sides to that story. Why is it a human right? Who believes that it's a human right? All right, then tell me why you think it is. Good. Um, healthcare is a human right because as the UN defines it, everyone has a right to a list of things. And I don't have to list in front of me, so I can't list it. But um, one of those things is the right to be alive. And if you don't have good health care, then uh, you're ha being deprived of part of the right to live. Good. Uh, it's similar to being deprived of water or shelter. Good. Okay, let's pick up on that. Health care, a human right? Give me s That was, I think, a good explanation, Henry. All right, give me the other side of the story. Not everybody agrees. You know, and these are people who are not terrible, awful people. Who, they don't want to see other people suffer, but they don't agree. What's the other side of the story? Healthcare is not a human right in American society. Who wants to give me that? I'll, I'll be the devil's advocate. Be the devil's advocate. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I don't have much uh, experience with that kind of view, but I do know that some people feel that if it, healthcare becomes a free commodity for everybody. Um, they're worried that people who don't pay their taxes are going to take advantage Good. of the system Good. and get free health care even though they do not pay taxes to the society that provides them that free health care. Good. I think it's about three quarters of it. That's good. What's the one quarter? I mean, I think Brendan got most of it. But there's another fundamental philosophical difference which conservatives hold a view, which is not a crazy view. Progressives hold a different view. Yes, Joseph. I think some people would say that if you make healthcare competitive, then like um, like a, make it a competitive market, then different people, um, the pro different providers and different medical providers will have to will have to cater to the people specifically, and so that could increase competition. Um, so I guess that's what some people say. Okay, but I want to get back to um, the argument um, 
fundamental argument against health care is a right. All right, let's just say, hypothetically, uh, Mr. Jones um, uh, started off his life with no money. He worked really hard, became very, very wealthy, takes good care of his family. They have very good health insurance. And then some politician like Bernie Sanders says, well, we should have health care for everybody. And Mr. Jones says, you know what? I've worked really hard in my whole life. I'm taking care of my family. Why do you want me to pay more in taxes to take care of somebody else who maybe is not working as hard, uh, maybe is not a nice person? Why should I have to take care of other people's families? Is that a good argument? All right, who wants to get into that? What's the... What's the two sides of the story? Well, like, that gets at the idea of a meritocracy where, like, we judge people for, like, how hard they work or, like, what they contribute to society. And we need to balance, like, equality and, like, I guess meritocracy. They're not completely different, but they sometimes compete with each other. All right, this is, this actually, and, and healthcare is one manifestation of it, maybe the most important, but not the only which is the defining issue of American politics today. And that has to do with what is a right, which all people are entitled to, as opposed to a society that says, hey, good luck to you, and, and you know, hope you make do well. But if you don't, don't come asking me to help you, because I got to take care of my family, you got to take care of your family, and we're all in it for ourselves. OK, and I don't really want to worry about your family. What about that? That a yeah. yeah. Well, I think what's crucial is that um, I think people who are arguing that you shouldn't uh, say give health care to everyone aren't aren't going to say that health care. Uh, well, they are implicitly saying that health care isn't a human right. But I think what they would say is that um, if the government uh, take complete control of the health care and like com makes it a completely public system, you're going to have something that's less efficient and less effective. I, they will say that, but that's not the key issue. That, that's an argument that they will make against, say, a national health program. But the deeper than that is the question of whether everybody is entitled to health. Let me ask you this from an international uh, perspective. Uh, Carolyn, I think you were in, you've been around the world a little bit? Yeah. All right. What is the status of health care among major countries on Earth? Do they have this debate? Um, yes, it's a major debate. I'm, uh, there, with the Millennium Development Goals and the uh, Sustainable Development Goals, I think a lot of the uh, goals addressed issues like malnutrition, which is, fun, uh, which is also fundamentally connected to well-being and health. Of course. Um, because if you're immunocompromised and you don't have as much uh, food as you may be, you become more susceptible to diseases. Absolutely. Okay. All right, I think um, the dividing line here, and we'll get back to this later on, is if something is a right, it is the obligation of society to provide that right, which generally means taxes. Now, we live where we are right now is some 75, 80 miles away from Canada. Uh, if you get sick, if you're diagnosed with cancer and you have to undergo chemotherapy or surgery, how much would it cost you in, in Canada? Anyone know? Zero. Zero. Not a penny. Now, they're 80 miles away from here, a country in many ways similar to ours, and yet anybody in Canada can walk into any doctor's office they want. They can undergo, and I was up there in Toronto last year and in the hospital, and people dealing with major surgery. I think the biggest healthcare cost for them is parking their car in the parking lot. <laughs> That's about it. And generally speaking, people argue about the strengths and weaknesses, but I don't think too many people would say that their system is radically worse than the United States, and many will say maybe it's a better system for a variety of reasons. All right, Annie, I want to get back to that issue, because that is the fundamental political divide in this country. And there are honest people on both sides of that issue. Let's get keep going. Uh, Seth Hart is uh, at Burlington. Yeah, uh, I talked about failure, and uh, I was going my civics teacher for a lot of these issues and topics that we could talk about. And I've been fortunate enough not to relate to it, a lot of these issues on a personal level, 
where I think failure is something that I've been pretty interested in, and I think every successful person has to deal with it. And so, uh, so yeah, I just thought it was a unique and very important issue. That's, I read that, and it's it is very interesting, but. Um, uh, what Seth is writing about is not health care and it's not the environment. He is talking about the challenges uh, that we face as human beings and the fa fear of failure. And you're going into the grading system and yeah. in schools and all of that. You want to say a word on how you feel the grading system sometimes impacts this issue? Yeah, yeah. So I think uh, ever since we got into like kindergarten, if we if we like do bad on like a spelling test or like. <laughs> Uh, we get like a big fat F or something that's like fail, you failed. But in reality, you, you didn't really fail. Like you, you, you might have messed up or something. But if you learn, if you fully, if you really learn from that mistake, then I don't think that's a bad thing. And I think you also write that there's a lot of pressure on young people, all of you, most of you, I assume, want to go to college, to get good grades and not get those Fs, right? Yeah. And that has an impact on your well-being. Who wants to pick up? Because I think that was an interesting observation that Seth made. Does he have a point? Let me get to some more. You guys on this spot side are pretty quiet there. Now, Isabel, why don't you jump in on, what about the fear of, of failure? Um, I mean, I'm. Hold that mic close to you, Matt, please. I'm going through the college process right now and um, choosing colleges and all that. And um, definitely within you know, the school scenario, high school and the difference between like the experiential learning and being able to kind of approach things without that fear of failure and how that um, kind of creates an environment that's more you have more of an ability to really learn from that rather than um, you know having to weigh well do I want to take AP biology this year or do I really need to maintain my GPA um, so, you know that's something that we all face but it, it has such repercussions on our futures from such a young age which is System. Okay, other thoughts? Uh, Thomas, did you want to jump in on that? Yeah, I guess I just, um, I guess I just feel that failure is, um, like, is hiding the fact that you didn't do well on, say, a spelling test necessarily better, like, is masking it by, uh, like, flowery language or whatever, uh, better than just having it clear, because I think you can learn, if you know that you didn't do well in your spelling test, and you have the opportunity to improve and succeed, and you know learn spelling test. But I feel like if you don't, if you consider what you are your performance adequate, even if it was poor, you're just it just leads to kind of a road to mediocrity. All right, Fyodos, you were the winning essayist, so now and I. Um, okay, so I'm just a freshman in high school, so I just started, and I think that the stress is already <laughs> happening because like. Do I, like you were saying, like do I take an AP class and risk my grades going down or do I just take a regular level class but keep my grades up and like also the peer pressure part of it is like uh, do I want to have classes with my friends but negatively impact my grade? So I think that it is a big problem. All right, let me see, a couple of you have raised that issue. You run the risk if you take an AP class, yeah, of... <laughs> Not necessarily getting A's, right? If you take a general class, the likely it is being bright, you're going to get A's, right? Some of you guys struggle with that issue? Or not? Thoughts on that? All right. Henry, I, I can see the wheels turning there. <laughs> on grades themselves, like Good. you're worried about, or like we're worried about um, having a lower grade if we take a harder class, when we, what we should be worrying about is actually learning, um, because grades don't always indicate how much you've learned, um, and, and at many schools, including my own, um, there's like a very like a rigid track towards like adulthood um, in terms of what you need to do before you graduate, um, and that's very limiting for, for students because no one learns the same way, no one learns at the same pace. And I know uh, other schools, um, it's not always that way, like, they do better with flexible pathways. Well, that's a, the, 
That's an excellent point. I can tell you from my own personal experience, when I went to college, I went to the University of, of Chicago. And it turned out, just my luck, that the issues that interested me were not what was being taught in the classrooms. So I spent half my life down in the library doing a lot of re reading and studying and getting bad grades because you know, <laughs> those weren't necessarily um, the issues that were being discussed in my classroom. All right, let me move on here. Um, I think we're up to Simon uh, Rosenbaum at Vermont Common School. Simon? Um, I wrote my essay about anti-Semitism in public schools, which is an issue that's extremely personal to me. Um, we live in a state that is 93 to 94, depending on which census you look at, uh, percent white and of Christian heritage. Uh, and that creates an isolated, uh, relatively ignorant uh, uh, society. And I'm talking about Vermont as a um, state, which means that uh, that can come out uh, towards youth, um, which there's been an uptick in uh, feelings of discrimination against youth, uh, Jewish youth, recently, which um, it's been 39% over five years, 39% increase in Jewish youth who feel discriminated or threatened. And that can uh, come out in school, which is, um, can create feelings of, of uh, bullying, uh, sadness, and can cause lifetime trauma. Okay, thank you, Simon. I'm going to get back to Fierdos. Um You have a similar concern, right? You're Muslim, Simon is Jewish. Um, yeah, I think that the feeling of isolation can really happen. And like he was saying, I mean, Vermont is a very white state. And um, especially with youth and um, news and stereotypes, people get the wrong image of others based on color, based on religion. And I think that in order for us to you know, get past these stereotypes, we have to kind of forget the past and not base people based on what religion they are, what country they came from. Okay, Andy, you wanna to get to that? Yeah, <clears throat> actually me and Simon actually talked about this issue before this. Hold that mic a little bit closer to your mouth, please. We, we, we talked about diversity, like in my school, we're very diverse. I'm from Muskie High School. And we get to know different culture and we share the same values, the same problem. And we can connect to each other and like work our way up to success. And actually that helps a lot if you come from another country like I do. And like I was telling Simon, maybe different school that that it's very diverse, you can go to like a non-diverse school and like share like the community, share the culture, share their experience, and maybe we can learn from each other. I think what any thoughts, uh, let me get to some people who haven't spoken very much. I'm sorry, I, you know, I can't see your name. Uh, Anissa. Right, Anissa, okay, yeah, move that over there, right. Okay, uh, let me pick up um, on Anissa's point. Uh, I want to do two things here. I want to somebody to answer Anissa's question of why change has not taken place and who are the forces. This is not the fossil fuel industry. It's not the insurance companies. Where is the opposition to uh, gun safety legislation coming from? Henry? Good, that's right. All right, I want to, what is the conservative argument or the NRA argument uh, against uh, gun control? Mm -hmm. so What's the argument? Yes. Let's say the second amendment, so the actual, because everybody has freedom to 
right? They say that. But what, above and beyond the Second Amendment, what do they argue? Do they, uh, what do they argue? Yeah. Um, they argue that their personal safety will be taken away if Good. their firearms are taken away. Good. Um, I, I also, I'll, I'll take the juxtaposition again, or not the juxtaposition, no, no, that's a fancy word, I can't use fancy words. Um, <laughs> the opposite position. Uh, Essex High School had a real lockdown. Uh, I think it was my freshman year. Henry was there too. It's terrible. Um, I I definitely think gun violence is bad and terrible, but I also think that the real issue with uh, gun violence lies with the idea of violence. Is the fact that somebody has been pushed to an extreme limit that they feel their only way to solve their problems is with violence. And I think. Uh, the kids get bullied um, a lot in our public schools, and most of the time uh, when gun violence occurs, it's the bully that uh, resorts to gun violence. And I think that if we can have a more accepting and welcoming community when we don't ostracize people who are like quiet, reserved, not everybody says, oh, don't talk to them, they're the weird kid, don't go near them. Mm -hmm. I think uh, a lot of our problems can be is all just in the humanity. Good point. Um, in other words, you know, as someone who believes in strong gun safety legislation, I think that's not the total answer, and I think that's what you're saying. Obviously, there are common sense things that have to be done, but you have in this country a lot of anger and a lot of mental illness. I mean, we get calls in our office, and I think every other elected official in America gets the same calls. And that is, I remember uh, my staff telling me that somebody called and, and, and the person said, I am very worried about my brother. I am worried what he may do to himself or to somebody else. We're trying to get help and we can't get help. Can't get help. And I think it's fair to say there are many, many thousands of people in this state and around the country who are walking around the streets, who own weapons, who are suicidal, who are homicidal, and it's hard to put yourself in that head. Uh, so I think the point is that it's not just, I think guns are a very important part of it. And people who should not own guns clearly should not have access to them and all that. Uh, but it is, there's other aspects of this as well, and that there are a lot of, you know, and, and um, you know, you just try to think about this horrible situation in Las Vegas last year, know that where some guy gets up there, and, and no one still knows why and breaks open the hotel window, shoots, kills 50 people, wounds many hundreds of people. Why? Um, more thoughts on that? Yep. I think, um, yeah. um, just to agree, uh, Colchester also had a lockdown, like for real, this year. Um, but also, you were asking about like what the main NRA arguments are for, um, and the two arguments that I always remember are gun, or like two catchphrases are guns don't kill people, people kill people, and that the, oh, and that the only way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun, and both of these things are generally untrue. I think you brought up suicide in your last point, and I think that's a very good point, because um, people who choose more lethal methods of suicide are more likely to actually, uh, to kill themselves before they actually receive help. Right. Okay. Um. Uh, if I may, yep. that kind of relates back to the uh, health care problem we're yep. having in our country. Right. Um, I also know that Vermont also has a problem with uh, mental illness and helping people who have mental illnesses. Um, there are a lot of people on Church Street that are mentally ill and could use help, but uh, again, the health care is not free and they can't afford it. And by the way, you should, that's right. But you should know that Vermont does a lot better than many other states. But um, the lack of, you know, that takes us to the opioid issue and, and, and many other issues. But mental health is a major crisis in this country and it relates to a whole lot of other things. Yeah, Seth? Um, in health class, we're going over the, the trial of health, which is physical health, mental health, and, um, and social health. And... Uh, our health teachers tell us how, how, how mental health is so much harder for people to talk about, to come forward, because 
looked at as such a bad thing. And with physical health or the obesity and stuff, it's it's obvious we can see it. Right? It's, but but with mental health, it, with mental health, it's not always. So we, it's not you can't always tell. And so that's the danger of it. And so it's looked at as a as a bad thing. And so that goes back to society. And now that's a very good point. And. If you broke your arm, people would say, oh, too bad you broke your arm, you had cancer, that's terrible. But if you have mental health problems, you're a little bit crazy and you're a little bit weird and there's a stigma attached to that that is not attached to a physical uh, problem. And, um, you know, we did, um, we have a very active uh, social media uh, network in my Senate office and we did, uh, we did a discussion uh, with a young African-American guy it, it, where that issue of stigma in mental illness is especially strong in the, in the African-American community, but it's strong all over. Uh, and it's a stigma that we have to break through. So insurance, when we talk about mental health insurance and, and health care coverage, obviously it must include mental health uh, as well as uh, physical health. Um, okay. Uh, Oh, did I? She's quiet. She's quiet. Okay. Uh, I believe on my list, Henry is the uh, um, last panelist to talk about his issue. Henry? Okay, let me do this because we'll, I think anyone, I think everybody made a presentation. Did I miss anybody? I think we got everybody. Um, and by the way, Katarina, raise your hand. Katarina's worked very hard in organizing this event. As did Kate and David in my office as well. And I would say we have two of our judges here today. Oh, can they please stand up? Wonderful. Thank you. No, and I should have said at the very beginning that these guys were selected not because I sat around judging the essays, but we had, I think, six Vermont teachers who looked at all the essays, and I thank them. Uh, what I want to do now is um, I want you to think hard. Uh, we have discovered, discussed a lot of stuff. We have really gone over some of the major issues uh, facing our country and, in some cases, the world. What are the some major, major issues that we did not discuss, that none of you wrote about, and that have not come up for discussion right now? Um, I think an issue that we didn't discuss was like addiction to media and addiction to being on screens and seeing, I think this also connects back to gun control laws, uh, seeing uh, violent video games and a lot of uh, we're exposed to a lot of those uh, things in our everyday lives and I think that's really important for our generation. Excellent point. All right. um, your world is different from your parents' world mm -hmm. and your grandparents' world in a very profound way. Okay. Um, oh God, I date myself as how old I was, but M. But when I first got involved in politics, if we wanted to send out a press release, you know what we did? it. We put it in an envelope. <laughs> and we took it to the post office, and two or three days later, you know, some newspaper received it. Uh, and now I have five people who do nothing else but send out uh, emails, you know, every other minute or something. Um, but Caroline's point about the amount of time people spend on computers and on screen is, is, is in fact a huge issue uh, for a dozen different reasons. It's the immunity to a violence that many people may see in video games. But it's not just that. It is being glued to the screen and what that does to you. There are a number of studies which suggest that might not be the healthiest activity in the world. 
um, and so forth. So that's a, a very good issue. All right, what other issues did we not talk about? Um, we didn't talk about the global water crisis. Good. Um, and how it affects uh, billions of people. Um, for example, in Colorado, there were multiple people arrested uh, from fights over uh, agricultural water supplies. Right. Uh, and that's in our own country. In developing countries, um, I believe in developing countries, the average was uh, something like it's primarily women uh, carrying uh, something like multiple gallons of normally not clean uh, water multiple miles a day. Good. Which, like, you can say, oh, two miles is not that bad, but then huh. carrying I wouldn't say that. <laughs> What is what is pretty heavy, you know? It's uh, right. That's a that's a huge international issue, and tied to climate change, it is an issue in this country. And as you know, in California, they significantly reduced uh, water consumption. All right, that's a that's an important issue. All right, what other issues? Yep, Thomas. Um, we haven't talked about the opioid epidemic. I believe one of the essays discussed it, but um, that panelist definitely isn't here. Um, I think, especially in Vermont, that's had an enormous effect on our. Um, on like the quality of life for a lot of Vermont. I did. We lost, I think, 110 people last year to overdoses. Very serious problem. Okay, what else? Um, we, this isn't really a state issue, but a whole globe issue. Um, poaching and the black market trade for animals, um, the endangered animals, animals going extinct. Um, that's a big problem facing everyone that lives here on Earth. Good. That's, uh, that is seeing the various species of beautiful animals being wiped out is, you know, heartbreaking. All right, but you guys still are not thinking. One minute, one minute. You are still not touching on, and it concerns me, it has a lot to do with media and it has a lot to do with schools. You're still not touching on what I consider to be one of the major issues facing our country uh, and the world. And that is that all over Vermont and all over this country and all over the world, you have people working incredibly hard and in some cases not making enough money uh, to take care of the basic needs. So there are people in Vermont who are working two or three jobs trying to uh, make sure their kids get enough food and they pay their rent and mortgages. Uh, and meanwhile, you have an incredible uh, unfair distribution of wealth and income, you see. And when you talk about power, you know, whether it is the power of the fossil fuel industry, or the power of Wall Street, or the power of the health industry, this is what you're talking about. And it's something you gotta be thinking about. Now, who has any idea about what percentage of Americans own what percentage of the wealth? Something you guys think about? Rahul, yeah, Rahul. That's exactly correct. Now, I see that is a, an astounding fact. That's why I use it in every speech that I give. <laughs> but nobody outside of Vermont knows that, so that's it. But am I missing something? All right, let me just, let me just pick up what Roland said. That's, in fact, a true fact. The other true fact is the top one-tenth of one percent, not one percent. One tenth of one percent owns as much wealth as the bottom ninety percent. Forty-six percent of all income generated today goes to the top one percent. The bottom forty percent of the American people have zero wealth. Don't know anything. They own a house. Their mortgage is bigger than what the house is worth. Now, to me, and tell me if I'm missing something. That seems to be an astounding reality that we don't talk about a whole lot. Am I wrong? Tell me if I'm wrong on it. I mean, all the other issues, every single issue you guys raised is enormously, but see, my job, I got to deal with the really, really important issues, which are not as important as the really, really important urgent issues, which are not as important as the world is coming to an end tomorrow issues. <laughs> all right, so all of these issues, everything that you discussed is of enormous consequence. But sometimes we have to think in a little bit different way. All right, why is what I said true? It is true. Why is it that we don't discuss this? Who has thoughts on that? 
Brendan, you're thinking about it? What's the answer? Why don't we discuss it? Is, is it important or not? Is it worth discussing? I, I definitely think it's worth discussing. I mean, the fact that I, I did not know that before, and that's why it's kind of hitting me hard. Um, okay. That's a three, three people. Three people own more wealth. I guess that's uh, Gates and uh, that was the guy from Bezos. Omaha. Bezos and the guy from Omaha is uh, who? Well, yeah, Warren Buffett, of course. I think it's those three guys collectively own more wealth than the bottom half of, of America. Um, how does that impact the politics? Forget the economy, forget about morality. How does that impact? If so few have so much money, how does that in fact impact politics? Yeah, who? Can buy influence. He surely can buy influence. influence. Right, okay, so you got one family, which is way up there, they're, I don't know, sixth or seventh, called the Koch brothers, K-O-C-H and they're very, very conservative. In the last election, they spent, I believe, $400 million to allow candidates who represent their point of view. Okay, so uh, let me close, because some of you I know have come from a long distance and want to get back home. Uh, parents, do we have a right to be proud of these kids? You know, and I think their generation doesn't necessarily get a fair shake. I get around the stake, and we have many, many wonderful and bright kids who are doing great things. Uh, so let me just thank uh, all of you for uh, submitting your essays, which were great, for participating in this discussion. And I wish you all the very, very best in your future endeavors. Thanks for being here. Thank you all. Thank you. Okay. And now what we did... What we did is we took all of your essays and we put them in the congressional record, which is mean you're, means you're a part of American history. That record will stay. And uh, we're going to give you some laminated copies of uh, your essays.